test us.
to Jordan Keep Brockman. Yeah, he's was at it this point. Back um, in 2014, was he? Yes. Okay. So he's the one that tried the uh, murder, the theater case, the, the murder case that the really, yeah, the death penalty okay. case. So, um, do you have the statements for opening? Yeah, it's, it should all be in here. So, this is yours. This is okay. Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security and Investigation Subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. We welcome everyone to this morning's hearing on synthetic drugs, and I will begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. Last week, the House took significant steps, to forward, steps forward in combating the opioid epidemic in America. Today, this subcommittee will examine a related but equally important issue, the scourge of synthetic drugs in the United States. Simply put, synthetic drugs are a prime example of how criminals can stay one step ahead of law enforcement. Today, parents have to worry not only about a child's exposure to illegal drugs, but about synthetic drugs, many of which are produced and marketed directly at children and young adults. Synthetic cannabinoids with names like Spice K2, or Scooby Snacks come in brightly colored packaging, often containing cartoon characters or other decorations to make them attractive to teenagers. 
Additionally, they are being marketed and sold as legal alternatives to marijuana, cocaine, and heroin. Thus, young people believe them to be safe, legal alternatives. However, they are addictive and deadly. That is because these drugs, while designed to mimic the effects of certain illegal drugs, often contain a panoply of additional chemicals, which can cause increased heart rate, psychosis, and death. The professor who is widely credited with first synthesizing cannabinoids for research purposes, Dr. John Huffman of Clemson University, has said, these things are dangerous. Anybody who uses them is playing Russian roulette. They have profound psychological effects. We never intended them for human consumption. Indeed, they are often labeled as not for human consumption. But everyone, the manufacturer, seller, and the user, knows they are intended to be consumed. Many states have banned these substances by adding them to their controlled substance schedules, which has resulted in a patchwork of state laws. Congress has also legislatively scheduled some of these substances, most recently in 2012. However, the problem is that as soon as a substance is scheduled or the process begins to schedule a substance, the manufacturers of these illicit drugs simply change a single atom and the substance is different and no longer a scheduled substance. Its chemical make makeup has been altered slightly, and though it may have the same effect on the body, it is no longer the same chemically. The process has been short-circuited. However, the need for a federal response remains clear. Since most synthetic drugs are manufactured and imported overseas, especially from China, in just a month in 2014, synthetic marijuana poisoned more than 200 people in my home state of Colorado and killed at least one. The Arapahoe County District Attorney, George Brockler, described people trying to cut their own heads off and set themselves on fire after using synthetic drugs. In my state, these drugs have been marketed as synthetic marijuana and sold at tobacco shops and convenience stores, often for a profit of 300 percent or more. It is big business, and these manufacturers are profiting off of our misery. I thank the witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee today and look forward to their participation. I now uh, recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Conyers from Michigan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I welcome the witnesses. Look forward to a, an important discussion. We're going to talk about synthetic drugs, a problem that is primarily affecting adolescents and young adults. And I, I wish to welcome our witnesses and express my gratitude to them for taking time to come here offer their personal experiences and insight. The abuse of synthetic drugs or designer drugs has been recognized as far back as the 1980s. Producers of these drugs work continuously to create legal alternatives to controlled substances like marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy, LSD, and opioids that produce similar kinds of highs. Sometimes packaged in small, shiny packets with images of cartoon characters printed on them and names like K2, Spice, Vanilla Sky, and Scooby Snacks, these products are marketed as a harmless good time. Unsuspecting teenagers, and young adults who are the primary consumers of these products can purchase so-called synthetic marijuana or bath salts at gas stations, convenience stores, novelty shops, and over the internet for further reinforcing the erroneous belief that these products are safe. Uh, However, in many cases, there are more potent and more hazardous than the control substances that they're meant to imitate. The chemical use to create synthetic drugs can be toxic to the human body, producing extreme paranoia, violent behavior, aggression, hallucinations, seizures, and even death. Synthetic drug use has even been linked to heart attacks, psychosis, and suicides. 
Instead of attending their child's football game or graduation or helping them complete college ap applications, parents find themselves in hospital rooms praying their teenager uh, wakes from a coma or in emergency rooms, hoping their child will regain, will regain their sanity and return to college. There are mechanisms in current law to allow for these drugs to be evaluated and controlled on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, for instance, the DEA has the ability to temporarily place substances on Schedule One when it is necessary to avoid an imminent hazard to public safety. However, the DEA is finding it difficult to keep pace with the development and production of new substances that are not currently illegal. Prosecutors have an additional tool, the Analog Enforcement Act of 1986, to prosecute those who produce synthetic drugs. This legislation serves as a method of criminalizing synthetic drugs without having to ban them individually. We in Congress need to learn more about these drugs, and that's why this hearing is important, and consider legis if legislation is needed. And we must be careful to craft an appropriate response that does not over-criminalize or over-penalize. I thank our witnesses for their time and, and the benefit of their expertise. I look forward to a discussion of this troubling issue. I thank the chairman and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Conyers. I would like to recognize <coughs> the full committee chairman, Mr. Goodlot of Virginia, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be here today as the Judiciary Co Committee continues its efforts to protect the American people from the real and growing danger of drug abuse. <clears throat> Last week, this committee moved five bills through the House that will help law enforcement and the treatment community address the opioid epidemic. So this hearing is very timely. I want to focus my remarks today on the threat of synthetic opioids, which present a critical threat to the American people. As we all know, the principal driver of the opioid epidemic in this nation has been the overabundance of prescription pain pills in the hands of consumers, especially opioids like oxycodone and hydrocodone. America's addiction to opioids has, of course, been noticed in the criminal underworld, and malefactors have taken big steps to profit off America's pain. One way they have done this is through the production of synthetic opioids including counterfeit prescription medications laced with fentanyl and fentanyl de derivatives. For those who have been paying attention to this committee's work, fentanyl is an opioid pain medication which can be 100 times more powerful than morphine. To put that into perspective, heroin is typically three times as powerful as morphine. Fentanyl is intended to be used to treat extreme pain associated with late-stage cancer and other significant health problems. It is not intended to be used recreationally, yet it is, and with the rise of synthetic opioids, it is increasingly being used unknowingly. Often drug traffickers will cut heroin with fentanyl to produce a more potent high. That has led to a rash of deaths across the country because of fentanyl's potency. In recent legislation, this committee included language to provide for a sentencing enhancement for any offender who traffics in heroin cut with fentanyl. With respect to synthetic opioids, fentanyl is also widely used. The profit margin is shocking. Less than a milligram of fentanyl can be lethal. That means a kilogram of fentanyl can generate enormous profits for the illicit trafficker, sometimes upward of a million dollars. So we have a problem. Between 2013 and 2014, the rate of drug overdose deaths involving synthetic opioids nearly doubled. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, a substantial portion of this increase appears to be related to the availability of illicit fentanyl. According to the DEA's 2015 National Drug Threat Assessment, Mexico is the primary source country for illicitly produced fentanyl in the United States. 
However, pharmaceutical fentanyl has also been diverted from the legitimate supply chain and into the illicit market. Some derivatives and analogs of fentanyl are manufactured in China and shipped to the United States. Drug traffickers and associated profiteers are continuously developing new ways to exploit the American market. Evidence of new opioid drugs, <coughs> excuse me, some more powerful than fentanyl, are turning up on the American street corners. For example, W18, a, syn <coughs> a synthetic opioid potentially 100 times more powerful than fentanyl, which law enforcement has called the next deadly synthetic street drug. We are under siege. It is time for Congress to act, and this hearing represents a good first step. I thank the witnesses for their testimony and look forward to their responses to our questions. I thank the Chair. Without objection, other members' opening statements will be made part of the record. <coughs> thank you, sir. I appreciate that very much. And I recognize uh, Chairman Goodlatte for uh, five minutes for Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. We have a very distinguished panel today. I will begin by swearing in our witnesses before introducing them. If you would all please rise. Raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. you may be seated. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses responded in the affirm affirmative. Mr. Louis Millone. Is that correct? Yes. Special Agent Louis Million is a Deputy Assistant Administrator for the United States Drug Enforcement Administration's Office of Diversion Control, where he has served since October 2015. Mr. Million acts as the Principal Advisor to the DEA Administrator on matters pertaining to the regulation of programs relating to the diversion of legally produced controlled substances and listed chemicals. Mr. Millione began his career with the Drug Enforcement Administration in 1997 and holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Villanova University and a law degree from the Rutgers University School of Law. Officer William Smith, Jr. is an officer with the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department. He has over 20 years of law enforcement experience, much of which has focused on narcotics. Mr. Devin Eckhart is the father of Connor Eckhart, who, who died tragically after smoking synthetic marijuana. Mr. Eckhart is the founder of the Connor Project and has addressed the United Nations to raise awareness globally about the dangers of synthetic drug use. He joins us today, along with his wife, Veronica, in continuation of that effort. Mr. David Nichols currently serves as an adjunct professor of chemical biology and medicinal chemistry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He has been recognized as a distinguished professor emeritus at Purdue University and as an adjunct professor emeritus of pharmacology and toxicology at Indiana University. Dr. Nichols holds a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from the University of Cincinnati, a PhD in medicinal chemistry from the University of Iowa, and was a postdoctoral fellow in pharmacology at the University of Iowa. We will now proceed. I will now recognize each of the witnesses for their opening statement, which will uh, uh, be limited to, to five minutes. Mr. Millione. Thank you, Congressman Buck, distinguished members of the committee. Synthetic cannabinoids, synthetic cathinones, deadly fentanyl analogs, and other toxic synthetic substances are flooding the United States, putting unsuspecting users at risk of death and permanent injury. DEA sees this drug threat as second only to the opioid scourge that is currently devastating our country. Synthetic cannabinoids and cathinones are unpredictable, untested substances placed in colorfully marked packaging and then marketed to our country's youth as a legal high. Emergency room doctors report a wide range of life-threatening side effects, including brain damage, cardiac arrest, kidney failure, and extreme psychosis. Synthetic cannabinoids and cathinones are sold openly in gas stations, convenience stores, head shops, and over the internet from domestic and foreign sources. Fentanyl analogs are a fast-growing, particularly troubling part of this synthetic drug threat. Here you have the dangerous convergence of synthetic drugs with this country's opioid epidemic. 
With fentanyl analogs, you have substances many times more potent than heroin that are being sold as heroin, mixed with heroin, or pressed into pill form and sold as prescription drugs. Fentanyl analogs are so deadly that a minuscule amount can kill an unsuspecting user. They can be ordered from Asia over the internet and delivered directly to your home. Because of the massive profit potential, Mexican cartels are aggressively purchasing fentanyl and fentanyl analogs from Asia, shipping it into Mexico, mixing it with other substances, and distributing it, distributing it throughout the United States. For all of us in the DEA, for all of our great federal, state, and local law enforcement partners, for all the dedicated prosecutors around this country, our primary mission is to protect the public. In trying to protect the public from this synthetic drug threat, here is the most frustrating part. The foreign-based manufacturers and domestic pied pipers of this poison often operate with impunity because they exploit loopholes in the analog provisions of the Controlled Substances Act and capitalize on the lengthy, resource-intensive, reactive process required to schedule either permanently or temporarily these dangerous substances. As we speak, criminal chemists in foreign countries are tweaking the molecular structure of controlled synthetics, keeping the same pharmacologic properties as the controlled substance, but helping the manufacturers and distributors avoid criminal exposure because of the altered molecular structure. We see these newly created synthetic drugs by the dozens every year. It's important to remember that these new dangerous substances get piled on top of the hundreds that we have already determined need to be controlled based on overdoses, deaths, and law enforcement encounters. DEA moves to temporarily schedule as many of this growing backlog as quickly as we can. But for each substance, that process averages between three and four months. Once temporarily scheduled, we seek HHS's evaluation for permanent scheduling, a process that can take at least several years for each substance. Despite our best efforts, DEA cannot control these substances at a pace that will prevent additional overdoses and deaths. We at the DEA are very grateful for all the legislative and scheduling tools Congress has given us over the years. We have had success investigating, prosecuting, and convicting the traffickers of these dangerous substances using the Controlled Substances Act when the synthetic drugs are placed in Schedule I. We have also successfully used the Analog Act for substances not placed in Schedule I. However, today's synthetic drug crisis has outgrown the Analog Act. Thirty years ago, when the act was passed by Congress, there were far fewer analog users and fewer traffickers than exist today. The trafficking networks that existed in 1986 were significantly less sophisticated than the transnational criminal networks currently operating. We will continue to do everything we can, working with the tools you generously have given us to bring these substances under control and protect the public. But we are many steps behind the traffickers and need your help. In the short term, this esteemed body could provide DEA and our law enforcement partners throughout the country immediate relief by placing the hundreds of substances we have determined to be dangerous into Schedule I. This would allow us to keep these synthetic drugs out of the country, get them off the shelves of retail stores, and bring to justice not the user population, but the egregious domestic and foreign traffickers preying on our youth, exploiting human frailty for profit, and flooding our country with these dangerous drugs. In the long term, we would welcome amendments to the Controlled Substances Analog Act that would align the act with, current, with the current threat and or perhaps other tools that would allow us to more quickly bring these drugs under control. We stand ready to work with you, provide you any assistance we can, and address any of your concerns. One concern that has been raised in that is that placing hundreds of dangerous synthetic drugs into Schedule I will impede legitimate scientific research. Here are several facts that may inform that concern. DEA has never rejected a proposal for bona fide research with any Schedule I substance. Currently, there are 469 approved Schedule I researchers, and many have multiple approved protocols to study different Schedule I substances. During the last year, it has taken an average of 32 days for DEA to approve a researcher's Schedule I application once that researcher has received FDA approval, a little more than four weeks. I would argue these are reasonable requirements when balanced with our duty to protect the public from these highly unstable and often deadly drugs. The DEA is committed to doing everything we can to address this threat. We look forward to working with Congress, with all our partners in the law enforcement, medical, and scientific communities to improve our effectiveness. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering any questions you have.
Thank you, Special Agent Milioni. Thank you. Officer William Smith, I recognize you for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security Investigations. Would, would, would you pull the microphone closer, please? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Would you pull the microphone a little closer to you? Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> and first responders who respond to the age of these individuals under the influence of synthetic drugs. The side effects of synthetic drugs are very common and similar to another drug which law enforcement officers encounter, which is phencyclidine or PCP. As the committee can see, I am not a small officer and have dealt with individuals both underneath the synthetic drugs and PCP. And let it be known, even in my stature at times, has been very difficult for myself and other officers to restrain these individuals. Individuals under the influence of these substances have an absolute almost supernatural human strength and de increased pain tolerance, which can lead to officers and other first responders being injured when dealing with these individuals. According to the Drug Enforcement Administration, poison control has seen a 229% spike in calls in relationship to synthetic drugs. Hundreds of these synthetic drugs are manufactured overseas in China and Mexico with no regulations or medical purposes. There has been reported 49,000 new chemicals used in these synthetic drugs. This is costing children and teenagers their lives. Also, these synthetic drugs are designed to keep law enforcement from finding the origin of the chemicals. The DEA testified this past fall in front of the House Energy and Commerce Committee that they are three steps behind the criminals when it comes to synthetics and analogs. In the past few years, synthetic marijuana has become the popular choice of synthetic drugs. It is designed to mimic the effects of organic marijuana and has a wide commercial availability. It can be bought at local stores for as little as $5 a piece, which has make it, made it popular among young people and the homeless. This is because it is sold under interesting brand names such as Bizarro, K2, Spice, and Scooby Snacks. These synthetic drugs are usually manufactured in foreign facilities in China and Mexico with an ever-changing chemical cocktail. All 50 states have outlawed synthetic drugs in some way. The problem is that the ever-changing chemical makeup. The manufacturers of these uh, synthetic drugs keep changing the chemical makeup to try to skirt the law and claim that their product are not illegal. Synthetic marijuana has two to five times the strength amount of THC than normal marijuana, and the availability and high use of drugs in recent years has led to a 1,400% increase in hospital visits from 2009 to 2012. Commissioner William Bratton of the City of New York Police Department stated, this is a scrooge on our society, affecting the most disadvantaged neighborhoods and our most challenged citizens. It affects teenagers of public housing, homeless city shelters, and is quite literally flooding our streets. In a previous session of Congress, the FOP supported legislation to add synthetic bath salts, marijuana, and other synthetic drugs to DEA schedule of controlled substance. But the chemical manufacturers have found loopholes for manufacturing and distri distributing these drugs or analog drugs because they are similar but not chemically identical to the uh, scheduled substances. With the loopholes these manufacturers and distributors sell and abusers of these synthetic substances all know exactly what to do with them. They ingest them, snort them, to get a dangerous and unpredictable high. In the past few years, we have found even a more, seen a more new drug of fentanyl. The synthetic fentanyl used by doctors is the most powerful opioid in medicine. However, according to DA, much of what is being found on the street is not diverted from hospitals, but rather from source from China and Mexico. Frequently, people buy it on the street with no idea it is fentanyl. 
is reported to be 100 to 200 times stronger than heroin. Just a quarter of a gram or a milligram, 0.25 milligrams can kill you. To put it in perspective, just how little 0.25 milligrams is, a typical baby aspirin is 81 milligrams. If you cut that 81 milligram tablet into 324 pieces, one of these pieces would be equivalent to a quarter milligram. Many of the 80% of all fentanyl seizures in 2014 were concentrated in just 10 states, Ohio, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey, Kentucky, Virginia, Florida, New Hampshire, and Indiana. And I'd like to thank the committee for hearing our national FOP representation. Thank you, Officer Smith. I now recognize Mr. Eckhart. If you could turn your microphone on for five minutes. Thank you very much. Before I begin, I'd like to make sure that each of the uh, committee members has a copy of the brochure. Thank you. As it was stated, my name is Devin Eckhart, and I'm joined by my wife, Veronica. And for very personal reasons, we chose to join you here today as you dedicate some time to better understanding the threats and issues surrounding new psychoactive substances, sometimes referred to as synthetic designer drugs. The epidemic rate at which they're spreading, the severity of their destructive effects both within the U.S. and globally, and the deadly impact they're having upon our countries, our communities, and our families. And it's our sincere hope and prayer that each of you will leverage both your individual and collective power to do more than simply discuss this growing problem, but rather you will choose to take action now and make changes necessary to eradicate these deadly poisons and their proliferation. It's my hope that my testimony will help provide some heart to the head knowledge that you hear so frequently in these conversations. Sadly, my wife, family, and I tragically know all too well the devastating impact of synthetic drugs. In July of 2014, our 19-year-old son, Connor, was a bright, vibrant young man with a full life ahead of him. He was really what most would have considered the all-American young boy. He had a great job. He was preparing to go back to college. He loved music, surfing, the outdoors. He had lots of friends. And of course, he was deeply loved by his family his sisters, his mother, and of course me, his father. This first photo here was a family shot taken July 5th of 2014. It was the last time we'd be together like this as a family. Eight days later, Connor was with a new friend. He made the seemingly innocent decision. He agreed to try something called spice, a synthetic poison. And the result was the second photo there. After many days in the hospital with our son in a coma, he was ultimately declared brain dead. Connor died July 16, 2014. After one smoke of illegal high purchased at a local store. At the time, <clears throat> We were unaware of MPSs, and we made the decision to share our story publicly, to be painfully transparent and naked with our tragedy before a watching world with the simple hopes that perhaps it might change one person's life. It might spare them and their family the horrific circumstances that we were facing and that we now live with each day. Since the death of our son 671 days ago, we've met far too many parents who have also lost their children to synthetic drugs like spice. And through our outreach, speaking, and education efforts over these past 671 days, we've communicated with literally hundreds of thousands of people throughout the United States and around the world who've lost loved ones or had their lives tragically destroyed by synthetic drugs. Unfortunately, what happened to Connor is not unique. Far too many people have suffered irreparable harm, including death, as a result of trying or using these poisons. However, what is unique about his story is how it has received an overwhelming global response to what we've shared publicly through social media, news interviews, TV, radio broadcasts around the world. His story is cut through the racial, socioeconomic, geographic, and religious barriers typically encountered. We know that MPSs are affecting everyone, everywhere. We're not just one voice. Connor's not just one face or some statistic. We represent. We represent the voice and the face of many others just like us. We've had the opportunity to reach millions of people on this subject. 
We've been interviewed by most of the major news and media outlets around the U.S. and globally, and of course we've leveraged social media. We've had individual unique Facebook posts that have reached millions at a time, with one reaching over 37 million people globally. We've had the opportunity to speak in many settings. We've worked with and spoken to senators, legislators, law enforcement officials, and many in government. We even met with a lord from the House of Lords in the UK this past summer as we were there on this subject. We've worked with numerous organizations in an effort to educate and increase awareness on the dangers of synthetic drugs. And we've worked to change laws so that these poisons are removed from our streets, our stores, and our communities. But more must be done. The problem is getting worse. Hundreds of new synthetic drug compounds have appeared around the world in the last few years, sometimes spreading at the rate of a new drug per week. And we're allowing these to come into our country. Illicit drug manufacturers are constantly working and changing the formulas, developing new chemical derivatives in order to evade the laws. And frankly, they're working faster than we are. The issue of MPSs needs to be addressed, and it needs to be done now. When this congressional gathering is ended, you return home. You'll return to your families, your children, those you love and care for. When we return home, we return to a family that's been forever changed because the death of our loved, beloved son is a result of synthetic drugs. As long as the people around the world pushing these poisons into our communities know that there are little or no consequence for their actions, and they do know this, we will continue to see the spread of synthetic drugs and the terrible harm they're bringing to our families and to our youth and communities. You have the power to do something about this. You're in positions of influence and leadership, and we're pleading with you to please take action. <clears throat> Don't just talk about and debate the issues. Bring about change that will get these substances out of our communities and deal appropriately with those behind the manufacturing and distribution of MPSs globally. Thank you for your time and your consideration on this. Thank you, Mr. Eckhart. Thank you for your courage, and, and I appreciate your wife being here also. Thank you. Dr. Nichols, I recognize you for five minutes. <coughs> Congressman Buck, uh, is my microphone on? Congressman Buck, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today. During my career, I worked with synthetic drugs, possessing a researcher's Schedule I DEA registration. My goal was to understand how the structure of a molecule engaged a biological target, thus better understanding how these substances act in the brain. I am very concerned about the potential harms to human health presented by synthetic drugs. Their availability requires a response, including regulation. Yet I do not believe that the proposed legislation would have prevented the recent emergence of spice mixtures, Rather, they focus on already known controlled substance types. We badly need reasonable approaches to controlling new chemotypes of synthetic substances. The challenge is to preserve researchers' needs while stemming the flow of dangerous synthetic chemicals. An appropriate response should consider three points. First, allowing research on potential therapeutic uses. Second, legislation should be guided by rigorous science. And third, the impact on mass incarceration, especially in cases where substances have not been fully vetted by the scientific community. Few investigators will pursue research with Schedule I drugs. Barriers to researching Schedule I substances discourage engagement. Obtaining a Schedule I license is not a trivial matter, and a researcher must be very motivated to obtain one, even if the investigator requires only small drug amounts that do not re represent a potential for diversion. In most cases, researchers are funded, for example, by NIDA to study only, del only the deleterious properties of a specific drug of abuse. But it is also important to have funding available for research to identify beneficial properties of Schedule I substances, as with recent medical marijuana. The costs and regulatory burdens of a Schedule I license deter research that might lead to new medicines. Research on Schedule I drugs is important because in the last decade, clinical studies have indicated that psilocybin, a Schedule I drug, may have unique therapeutic efficacy in treating anxiety, depression, and addiction to alcohol and nicotine. As another example, Professor Charles Nichols at LSU decided to study the receptor targets of hallucinogens before he had a Schedule I license. The only hallucinogen available without a license was called DOI. He discovered quite by accident that DOI has potent anti-inflammatory properties, indicating potential efficacy in treating cardiovascular disease and asthma. Had DOI been in Schedule I, he never would have discovered this therapeutic breakthrough. Most pharmaceutical companies have abandoned research on novel drugs for depression, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and others. They have unknown causes. The research is extremely expensive with a low probability of success. 
Ironically, the kinds of substances we are concerned with here today act in the brain, and it's quite possible that new medicines will result from more research on them. Any responsible legislation should protect research that might lead to the discovery of new medicines. Without solid scientific evidence, it's unwise to schedule new molecules with untested potential. Sometimes changing a single atom on a molecule can dramatically alter its pharmacology. Superficial comparisons of chemical structure resemblance or predicted pharmacological effects, as in some proposed bills, are not a reliable basis for Schedule I classification. For example, bupropion or Welbutrin, an effective antidepressant, resembles cathinone, yet it has no abuse potential. There are hundreds of thousands of synthetic compounds that could be made, and we still know very little about just a few of the most recent ones. Also, there's no schedule category for drugs that have no known medical value, but which have also not been shown to have high abuse potential. We should carefully research compounds flagged by law enforcement by scheduling only those with demonstrated public health and safety risks. Input from the scientific medical community would preclude the scheduling of compounds with no demonstrated public health dangers, preventing needless prosecution and incarceration of individuals for using these substances. Persons who manufacture and distribute these substances that harm human health should be held accountable. But many people today do not believe that making users criminals for simple possession is appropriate. There is a consensus developing that use of psychoactive substances is a public health problem, not a criminal matter. The war on drugs has been largely unsuccessful in preventing drug use and has contributed to our country having the largest prison population in the world, a large percentage of whom were incarcerated as a result of nonviolent drug offenses. In summary, the proliferation of new synthetic substances represents a great threat to the health of our youth and regulation must be a component to the solution of this problem. But I strongly believe that drug control and scheduling decisions should be grounded in the best science. There must be balance between the needs of research and enforcement so that potential new therapeutic discoveries are not lost by restricting access to novel compounds. Humans and adolescents in particular are known to be curious and to experiment, but most pass through that phase without serious consequences. Draconian penalties and felony convictions for use only add to the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. We will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions for the witnesses, and I will recognize the Vice Chairman, Mr. Gomert from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank all the witnesses for being here. It is an important subject. Um, and uh, Mr. Eckert, I know it's, it's obviously very difficult for you, what a handsome young man um, you and your wife had obviously uh, brought a lot of joy. You mentioned that he bought it legally. Did you ever find out how he heard about this and where he purchased it? Connor was with uh, a new friend that day. He had actually been offered, uh, I think it's on? Yeah, I think it is. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, he had actually been offered marijuana. He declined, he didn't want that, he didn't want to be around it. And as an alternative, uh, the synthetic drugs were suggested and they were purchased at a local smoke shop along with, you know, other tobacco products. And I think truly was viewed as, uh, as a safe alternative. Because it was a, legal. It, legal. Yeah, so and, it must be okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's youth find themselves often in situations of peer pressure and he was declining one thing and it was a, a way to concede. No, he was area. acting admirably relying on his government that uh, if it was too harmful, it would be illegal, obviously. Um, and obviously, uh, as, as you and your wife have been doing, uh, you've been raising awareness. If he had been aware of the dangers, obviously he was sharp enough and uh, moral enough that he would have turned it down. He just didn't know the risk. Um, Mr. Milione, um, how big is the market for illicit prescription drugs compared to heroin? The market for prescription, prescription illicit or prescription opioids is massive. Uh, it would be hard to put a number on it. If you put it in overdose numbers, we're talking 18,000, 19,000 overdoses in one year of prescription opioids. And with heroin, you have almost 9,000. Um, so that's a trend. Heroin is trending up, but you have a massive prescription opioid problem. So is the opioid 
trending down or just heroin trending up? We don't see a downward trend in prescription opioid abuse or overdoses. Uh, that's trending up, uh, not at quite the rate that uh, the heroin is trending up. They're both trending up. Um, heroin is intersecting, uh, unfortunately, on that graph. Hmm. Isn't it interesting as our federal government is um, forcing people to turn away from God, um, they're searching for answers in other places that are not, uh, not so good for them. Um, do you know what the profit margin for a kilogram of a synthetic uh, cannabinoid is? It's a, it's a massive profit uh, margin. So for f maybe $1,500, $1,000, up to $2,000, you could buy a kilogram of a synthetic substance, a th synthetic cannabinoid, and maybe about 13 kilograms of, let's say, marshmallow leaf. And you could turn that into about $250,000, that initial 1000 to $1,500 into $250,000 of profit. Um, Dr. Nichols, uh, you wrote an article in January of 2011 uh, where you expressed remorse because someone had used your published research to produce a substance that caused six deaths. How could they have used your article to produce that. I mean, did you go into that kind of detail? Or it's hard to believe they could have taken your article and, and what used that. The situation is the chemists who are involved in making these substances are quite accomplished. I think many of them must have PhDs. So we published in the open scientific literature, and I had been doing studies of ecstasy, its mechanism of action. Right. So one of the compounds we had made was called MTA. And in the assay that we used was a rat assay. It really identified compounds which cause the release of a brain transmitter called serotonin. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't represent the effects of ecstasy, but somebody apparently in the Netherlands saw that paper we published, and actually we had published that it was a, a potential antidepressant when, when we actually looked at it. They saw we had made it. The synthetic methods are in all the published literature, so they simply made a batch of it and ironically put it into tablets called flatliners. Uh, this was really the first case where I, I was really shocked because all medicinal chemists who work in this field publish their work in the open literature. And if you work with cocaine analogs or hallucinogens or MDMA analogs, it's all out there. The methods are on the papers. Yeah. It just takes someone who can mine that literature to find the kind of compound they want to work with. But you weren't publishing the recipe or anything. It's, it's in the scientific publication. But not in your article. That's what no, I'm not in the essay, yeah. no, no. I'm just saying, yeah. I, I think you blame yourself too much for that, but uh, I appreciate the time. Thank you, you're back. Chair recognizes the ranking member from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. This is a very important hearing. I want to thank each of the witnesses, uh, uh, Mr. Malone and um, Mr. Smith, uh, Mr. Eckhart and certainly Dr. Nichols, thank you so very much. I hope I pronounced Mr. Maloney uh, almost uh, correctly. Uh, I was uh, previously in a meeting and I will have to go to another meeting dealing with criminal justice, but this is a very important hearing. Let me thank the uh, chairman uh, as well, uh, Mr. Buck. Let me also thank uh, the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Sinsenbrenner, and the chairman of the full committee, and Mr. Conyers, the ranking member of the full committee. Uh, I am grateful for the work that uh, we have done to organize this hearing and bring the use and abuse of synthetic drugs to the attention of the Subcommittee on Crime. We have several witnesses here today who will provide us with their own unique perspectives regarding the effects and dangers of synthetic drugs. Um, my home state of Texas has been significantly affected by the proliferation of synthetic drugs. Kush uh, is a street name for the most popular illegal substance in Houston right now, and it has caused great harm. It is a designer drug made from combinations of synthetic chemicals sprayed on plant material, then packaged like candy, smoked like marijuana. It has no constraints, no regulations, no guidelines. Kush is typically many times more potent than natural marijuana and produces a physical and psychological effects that are uncharacteristic of natural marijuana use. People who have used Kush have su suffered paralysis, brain damage, heart attacks, and even death. Um, Kush is but one name or supposed brand name for synthetic marijuana. 
and law enforcement agencies, including those in Texas and across the nation, have identified hundreds of names given to synthetic marijuana. This committee uh, hearing is important for that reason. We need to get the facts. Whatever we generate in legislation should be confined by the facts. We don't want to expand uh, the uh, fishnet, if you will, on individuals who uh, happen <coughs> to be either um, attracted, addicted, or using this drug. And I hope that we will have um, enough facts in our record to be able to craft a sufficient federal response uh, to this very important issue. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask unanimous consent that the rest of my statement be included in the record. Without objection. And I'm also going to ask that uh, my questions for the uh, witnesses be submitted uh, for answers to come. I ask unanimous consent that my questions uh, submitted to the witnesses that I may present. Without objection, so ordered. And I'm going to pose a question to Dr. Nichols. I'm concerned about making sure that we are not so broad uh, that we, in fact, um, do not uh, appropriately respond to uh, synthet synthetic drugs. And so, uh, and let me, by the way, um, in a moment of personal privilege, my daughter graduated with honors from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, so you're elevated even higher in my eyesight. Um, why is it important, uh, Dr. Nichols, that the scientific experts in the fields that study synthetic compounds play a role in determining the appropriate response in terms of drug scheduling and other control measures? Um, and might I ask that you describe any promising research that you're aware of on these issues? Well, the legislation that I've seen in general basically tries to expand the landscape around known compounds. And I've done patent legislation and I work with patents. And in patents, pharmaceutical companies will claim a genus of compounds. And in a recent case, there were 58 trillion compounds. So the possibility for harm is sort of unimaginable. Mm -hmm. So you, I think we really need uh, expert medicinal chemists and neuropharmacologists to look at these compounds that are proposed for scheduling to really determine. I know I've seen some of the proposed bills, and they basically try to think of everything possible. One of the comments I made was we're talking about uh, hallucinogens, cathinone analogs, fentanyl analogs, and synthetic uh, cannabinoid uh, compounds. But what if a new type of drug hits the street? There's no legislation that would take care of a new chemotype. So then we all of a sudden we have another cathinone. Some Chinese chemist plays around the lab, finds something we've never seen before, and now we have another scourge. So the laws that are proposed really are sort of hindsight laws based on if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I think we need some out-of-the-box thinking in terms of ways to approach this that would cut off the possibility for new chemotypes of drugs that we haven't seen yet and would be more careful in uh, circumscribing the things that we have using expertise. There's lots of expertise in the American Chemical Society and in, in pharmacology societies that could sit down and look at these and say, these are problems, these need some evidence. Rather than just casting a wide net that's going to create all kinds of problems, many of the compounds may not be even uh, harmful to human health. So it's, it's kind of an unfocused shotgun approach that I think could be much more focused on real problems with some expertise, and, and I just haven't seen that brought to bear. Let me thank you. I know the other uh, witnesses will have some instructive information that I will draw from your answers. But Dr. Nichols, um, I think you have laid uh, uh, a landscape or parameters that we should seriously look at. We just had a successful set of legislative initiatives on opioid, and I think uh, it was based on a lot of thought, a lot of hearings, opioid and heroin. We passed a series of about 18 bills last week that all of us uh, can um, uh, find uh, satisfaction in the way we approached it. The Judiciary Committee bill did not have any mandatory minimums at all. It was treatment and recognition of the vast problem. I want to make sure that we are accurately and appropriately addressing this problem, and I will take uh, to, to heart, if you will, uh, Turk on advisement, uh, your very astute analysis dealing with the vastness of compounds and, and, and subsets that we should address to make sure that we narrowly address these poisonous synthetic drugs and not uh, have a wide, uh, a wide reach. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you so very much. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and uh, appreciate your time. Put this down. Thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Uh, I want to particularly um, thank Mr. Eckert and uh, Veronica for being here today uh, for your testimony. 
Um, like many of the folks in this room, I'm a parent. I have a 16-year-old son and a uh, 14 and a 10-year-old. And uh, this issue causes me great agony. And uh, for you, oh, my heart goes out to you and your wife. Uh, I pray for you and your family for what you've been through. I thank you for your, your courage to be here. It's uh, incredible what you're doing. And thank you for raising awareness. And I intend to take your message back to my district and certainly to my family. But I wondered if you might be able to share with us what uh, you believe in your experience so far is the most effective method of raising awareness and what's the most efficient method in curtailing the use of synthetic drugs. May I speak? Can she address? Yes, please. Thank you so much for having us here. Um, obviously, it's very difficult for Deb and I. Not only do we travel overnight from California, but we are so passionate about this subject. And Laws take time to change. They obviously need to change now. But getting that public service announcements, which is now happening with um, the opiate and heroin epidemic, getting public service announcements out there, recognizing that these products are available in candy form, in liquid form, in the vapes, in the e-cigarettes, in the marijuana type leaf, getting that message out there to parents, they simply do not know. I said, I wish I could carry, I have a book this big that is full of stories, full of stories from people who have lost their children, either to death or to mental illness from using. People simply don't know. It needs to be taught in the classrooms. Teachers need to know. Physicians need to know. Nurses need to know. Counselors need to know. The public needs to know at large. And this is something that could be done immediately. Awareness, education, prevention. And I'd like to also mention that if you are 13, 14, 15, 17 years old, under 18 years old, and you become addicted to spice, and it is very addicted, where do they go? There is not a place for an addicted child to get treatment. And this is a very serious issue needed to be discussed at another time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. I appreciate your being here and appreciate your testimony. Um, um, Agent Million and uh, Officer Smith, I wondered if you might be able to address this issue. I, I as a former prosecutor, uh, have had interaction with law enforcement over the years. Um, K2, K2 was an issue not too long ago. Hit the, hit the stores, it was in the local um, gas stations, at the party stores. Uh, I got a, a, a call from one of my local Police Chief, uh, uh, Chief Narsh from Lake Orion Police Department who told me that he was trying to get it off the, the, the shelves but he couldn't do it because there was no legal authority to do that. H how do we get ahead of this? How do we, how do we uh, what do we do f to give you the tools in law enforcement to, to, uh, to prepare for the next generation? And uh, clearly these folks that are selling them in the stores are selling them with knowledge that they're being used in an illicit way. They're not just bath salts or, or incense. It's being used by our youth in a way that's uh, intended for uh, some sort of uh, high. How, how do we get ahead of this? And how do we, uh, what, what can we do as Congress to, to help and give you the tools you need? Thank you very much for the question. Um, as I mentioned before, there, we've already identified hundreds, not based on theory, but based on overdoses, deaths, law enforcement encounters. We're getting multiple every month. So now we're talking dozens every year. So the most effective way to give immediate le relief to our state and local partners and, and our federal partners is get them into Schedule 1. That would, solve, that would solve a couple problems. It would give us the ability to get them out of those stores, to be able to stop it at the, that, at the border. But more importantly, we'd be able to increase the cost of those that are trafficking in, trafficking in it, not using it, trafficking in it in the United States, but then overseas because they operate with impunity. That would be one uh, one fix. Another possible uh, solution would have to do with that labeling. In the same way that with anabolic steroids, there's, there's a bill that you have to have appropriate labeling. If there's, if there's false labeling, there may be some kind of a, um, a false labeling penalty that would, uh, would increase the civil penalty and, and tamp down the incentive for these retail stores, convenience stores, to have this in their, in their, um, in their uh, places of business. So those are a couple uh, ideas, but we'd be more than happy to work um, on any, providing any technical assistance in that area. Um, 
Representative, as uh, Veronica spoke to it, PSA and getting the word out on the street, and I, I believe Mr. Buck or uh, Mr. Grimhart spoke to the fact of these kids are buying this legally in stores. And again, thinking that it's a legal substance, they're not doing any of the hardcore street drugs that we used to see them do, cocaine, heroin, marijuana. They're not taking this out of the fact of the ramifications that come from using something that they buy at their convenience store for $5. Thank you both very much. I wish we had more time on this. I, 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 uh, I'm in anything I can personally do, and I know others are the same way. Any way I can help, I would love to be a part of that solution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. And the uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Chu from California for five minutes. Yes, uh, Mr. Million, the uh, Controlled Substances Act pr provides for two mechanisms for controlling drugs and, and other substances. Congress can do it legislatively, or the DEA, in collaboration with the Department of Health and Human Services, can do it administratively. When the DEA takes an action to temporarily schedule a substance, retailers begin selling new versions of their products with new unregulated compounds in them. In your opinion, how effective is the current legislative framework? Certainly, we appreciate all the tools that Congress has given us. The challenge in this space is that it's a reactive process, and it's a lengthy process, resource-intensive process. And the same um, medicinal chemists, pharmacologists that do this analysis for DEA and work with our partners at HHS also travel the country. I think it's 70, 65 different federal prosecutions under the Analog Act as, as experts. So it's a very reactive process. Scheduling temporarily takes, on average, three to four months after harm has, has already occurred. Once we initiate that process, it's generally two to three years uh, by the time uh, HHS can do their uh, analysis. So when you pile on top the, the dozens that we're getting every year, on top of the hundreds that we've already identified, it's, it's, it's like pushing that proverbial massive rock up a hill. And what should Congress do to expedite the classification and scheduling of these synthetic drug analogs? I, I'd be willing to work with your staff to talk specifics, provide some technical advice, anything that would either streamline that process mm -hmm. or give us some breathing room and get the ones that we've already identified uh, onto Schedule 1. Yes, I'd love to work with you on that. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Milan, in order to skirt federal and state laws, many of these synthetic drugs are being labeled as not intended for human consumption or legal in certain states. How are these claims affecting law enforcement's ability to prosecute synthetic dr drug-related uh, crimes, and what, what, could, what could be done about this? Well, that's the, that's the uh, evil brilliance of the, some of the traffickers. They're going to look at the, the law, the Analog Act, and they're going to create something and put that on the, the substance so that that creates a defense for them. So now you have a battle of the experts when you prosecute them under the Analog Act. So um, one way that you could potentially fix that, I mentioned a, mo a, a moment ago, is if you had some kind of a labeling requirement so that they're appropriately labeled, that would, it would, it would defeat that uh, defense. But that's kind of in the realm of the technical assistance and advice or uh, interaction we could have to maybe talk about those in greater detail. Um, Mr. Milan, a majority of these synthetic drugs have been manufactured and imported from China. What has the DEA been doing to combat the manufacturing of these chemical compounds? That's, that's one of the biggest uh, challenges, right? The, the manufacturers operate with impunity because the majority of these substances aren't in Schedule One. Fortunately, we have a very uh, strong and growing relationship with the Republic of China. Um, in October of 2015, they, um, they scheduled 116 of these new psychoactive substances, these substances, these, these synthetics. And as a, as a result of our cooperation with them, they provided leads with us to, sh to identify domestically where uh, gatekeepers and um, not cartel heads, but cartel distributors would be in the United States so that we could work under our laws here in the United States to, to bring them to justice. And how are these precursor chemicals being imported into the United States? They're just being, they're being uh, labeled as research chemicals. They're being, like any other contraband, uh, mislabeled and then sent in. And unfortunately, the majority of them, we don't have the authority to stop them. We can't help our partners at the uh, CBP, Customs and Border Patrol, uh, because the majority of them are not scheduled. Um, and Officer Smith, um, in the past several years, there's been an enormous increase in, in the variety and number of synthetic drugs available. 
uh, the effects of the drugs can vary so greatly. As a first responder, what additional safety and health precautions do police officers have to take when approaching an individual suspected to be under the influence of synthetic drugs? Um, <clears throat> Ma'am, well, from the law enforcement first responder standpoint in general, be it uh, law enforcement, fire, EMS, uh, dealing with individuals on synthetic drugs, and I, I, I spoke to it earlier, is similar to the effects of PCP on an individual. You know, they're very uh, unpredictable to deal with. They uh, become very, they can be very passive at one moment, and with a flick of a light switch per se, they are extremely agitated, they are very violent, and we're getting officers and firefighters and EMS responders hurt from the synthetic drugs. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. And the chair recognizes Mr. Labrador from Idaho for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will yield back uh, one or two minutes to Mr. Bishop, who has a few more questions. Thank you, uh, Congressman Labrador. I uh, wondered if we got a, a thousand questions here in a very small amount of time. But I wondered if I might ask the uh, Mr. Millon, um, the, the DEA's Project Synergy found that um, millions of dollars of the sales of these synthetics were being um, funneled back to the Middle East uh, for, for what I assume to be terrorism purposes uh, or funding terrorism. Can you, can you comment on that and share more about that? Sure. Uh, Pro uh, Project Synergy, um, it was a, a multi-year, multi-agency uh, investigation. And you're right, about millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in proceeds were going back to the Middle East, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon. We continue to, to explore that. We work with our partners at the FBI and our Special Operations Division, which is a multi um, multi-agency coordination center. Um, but that operation resulted in the seizure of uh, almost 7,000 kilograms of cathinones, cannabinoids, um, um, and a number of uh, successful hundreds of prosecutions. Uh, but we still, we are, we are still exploring that. And uh, I wouldn't be able to, to, to speak to, to some of the threads of those investigations on the money. One follow -up, quick follow-up. Um, we, we know that this is not necessarily manufactured here, that in many cases it comes from China overseas somewhere. How is the trafficking handled when it gets to the United States? Who, who, who does it? Who, cartels? Or, um, well, on, the, in the, on, on both the synthetic cannabinoid cathinone side, but on the fentanyl analogs, which are that, that deadly, um, much more potent than heroin uh, synthetic, um, there's, there's several ways, but the primary way is manufactured in China, sent into Mexico. Mexican cartels now are exploiting and capitalizing on the opioid epidemic in the country, obviously, with their heroin trafficking. And they're taking the synthetic fentanyl, mixing it with heroin and other substances, and sending it across the border. Southwest border, um, couriers taking it to Lawrence, Massachusetts. Really, any part of the country is being touched. Um, but you can also get it directly from China. You can order it over the internet. You could get this substance sent to you, delivered directly to your home. Um, you could mix it with other compounds and then distribute it in the United States. It's a, uh, it's a terrible, treacherous uh, world that, that, that they're uh, creating. Thank you very much for your testimony. I yield back to Congressman Lambert. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bishop. Um, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I applaud the chairman for calling this hearing and taking steps to fight this epidemic. Um, Mr. Eckhart, I want to express to you, I, I have five children, and I can't even imagine what, what you're going through. And I want to express my deepest condolences to you, to your wife, and to your entire family for your tragic loss. It's, I'm sure it's difficult to be here and testifying, but I greatly admire the courage that you have to testify here and to help us uh, to more fully understand the true impact of these drugs in, on our society. Mr. Millione, I want to follow up on some of the questions that were being asked. To your knowledge, is DEA working with Customs and Border Protection to interdict these shipments? We are working with them as, as closely as we can and um, with the tools that we have, absolutely. Do you have cooperative agreements in place? Uh, I, I don't know as far as the agreements, but we, I'm, I'm sure there are MOUs that exist, but there's a uh, healthy working relationship with CBP. Yeah, and you think that working relationship is functioning? I, I believe so in this context, yes. Can you estimate the number of prosecutions of th synthetic drug manufacturers and distributors that have occurred in the United States? I'm sorry, I, I missed but a second. Can you estimate the number of prosecutions of synthetic drug manufacturers and distributors that have occurred in the United States? It would be very hard for me to come up with a hard number. I'd be happy to, to take that back and get that, get that to you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith. Um, 
how has your department had to shift its drug enforcement policies in order to combat the influx of synthetic drugs? The combating of synthetic drugs uh, is typical enforcement of any other law. The fact that we're running into a problem in the same as Mr. Malone and as Dr. Nichols testified to is the ever-changing uh, chemical makeup of these synthetic drugs for prosecution. Um, is was enlightened by the DEA and, Mr. and Dr. Nichols. Just them tweaking one chemical atom of that synthetic drug changes the enforcement aspect on law enforcement side due to the fact of now you have a, a chemical drug that was actually scheduled now they change an atom it's no longer that chemical it's a new chemical so therefore it cannot be prosecuted okay thank you mr eckhart is there anything that you have not been able to tell us that we haven't asked you that you would like to say how much time do you have <laughs> uh, i i think one of the things that occurs to me is as this conversation goes on is i'd say at what price tag at what price tag are changes being made or being delayed from a parent's perspective, from the general public's perspective, we would feel like, and the many, many hundreds of thousands of people that we've communicated with, would feel like if something looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, let's call it a duck. We're, <clears throat> we're down at the molecular atom structure, and because they change one molecule, it skirts our laws, and it's available. How many young people have to lose their lives to death or permanent disability? What's the impact on our community and our society as a result of that? And at what price tag are we preserving the ability to research these or to talk about them or to study trends and statistics before we actually do something? Let's do something. If it's not the right thing, we can always change it down the road as we learn more. But um, I think parents and the general public out there need to be informed about this. We had no idea. We were not parents with our heads in the sand. We had talked to our children about drugs and the perils of what they face as youth growing up in today's world. Um, we didn't have a clue about what's going on. And the more we learn, the more terrifying it gets to be a parent in today's world. Um, we need help from our government. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, chair recognizes the chair of the full committee, Mr. Goodlatte from Virginia. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I apologize for not being able to be with you for the entire hearing. I did appreciate, uh, uh, in particular, uh, your testimony, Mr. Eckhart, and uh, this uh, uh, brochure. I have, a, in my uh, experience here in the Congress, uh, seen a few other people who have basically dedicated their lives to trying to make their son or daughter's life meaningful. Uh, and I know that's exactly what you're trying to do uh, in, in dealing with a horrific loss like you are. And so I, I very much commend you for that. I, I don't know how much your, your foundation's research has uh, uh, given you about this, but, and it may have been asked already, but some of these uh, products like K2 and Spice and Chronic that I see on the bottom of the brochure here, uh, they look like you know, regular commercial products, and that increases, I'm sure, the opinion that people think that, hey, this must be legitimate, it's for sale here in this store. Um, what do you know about those companies? Are they legitimate companies that make other products, or are they just totally illegal operations that have this stuff mysteriously appear in various stores for people to buy? Yeah, to the best of our understanding, uh, there's no legitimate use for the chemicals, and uh, the, the businesses that are proliferating this, um, these products out there in the marketplace um, are not selling legitimate if products. If you were to alongside. sue them, they would just disappear in thin air. They're, they're not we tried a, to find, we, with, in the case with our son, we tried to, to discover who was the manufacturer and were unable to, to get that, even though we had the, the packet itself. So. There's a, a deep web, and it's, um, it's not easy to go and identify. These, these are not products that are typically being made in some <coughs> manufacturing plant with the name of the company out front. You think they're made in the U.S. or are made outside and shipped in? Uh, our understanding is both, both. And how much cooperation did you get from law enforcement, from the DEA and others, in trying to 
do that research up that chain to find out who, who made it and where they made it. And that kind of thing. Uh, from our perspective, the, yep. uh, the law enforcement and the people around us were very supportive. Um, but they weren't able to help you but we weren't go able up the to chain up and find out who actually made that product that was in that bag. Right. Um, Mr. Millione, uh, you testified about how potent fentanyl is, even if it's just absorbed through the skin. What harm could this substance do if dispersed over a crowd of people? It could kill them. I mean, it would, dis it would depress their, I'm not a, a scientist, obviously, but in, it, we fortunately have much smarter people than myself on our staff that are, that are scientists, and it will, re re it will depress your respiration and it could cause uh, death. So it's, um, as was talked about, a very minuscule amount can cause death. So um, one of the challenges, obviously, for the unsuspecting user uh, is that they could be taking fentanyl and not realize that it's fentanyl and overdose. But then for my brothers and sisters in law enforcement, the first responders, uh, and within the DEA, when, when we go in on warrants, um, it's a very, very uh, difficult situation. Every time you encounter heroin now, you have to assume it's fentanyl, because if you, get, you, you inhale it, it becomes airborne, and you get it on your skin, you could have that kind of a reaction. So uh, that's something that law enforcement all over the country is, and you know, EMS, firefighters, everyone is concerned with that. And that's added, it's cut, heroin's cut with that, and some other things are cut with that in order to increase the addictive nature of it? Is that? Increase its potency, so it, it can be so added. It develops a reputation, people go back to it because, hey, that was really, well, that's, that's, the, that's kind of the, the, the tragic part of it, right? It, it, yeah. Word gets out that there's a very strong, and, and traffickers will do that. They'll spike something very hot so that when it goes out, um, unfortunately, you'll have overdose deaths. Word will travel, and that, that particular X product is very, very potent, so there'll be a desire for that uh, potent, uh, des desire for that product. So um, it's mixed with heroin. It's mixed with other, other substances. It really can be mixed with anything um, just to kind of expand its its uh, commercial viability. But adding that to uh, some other product, as dangerous as the other product might be, like heroin, adding that to it is almost tantamount to knowing you're going to be committing a certain number of murders uh, as, as that's distributed amongst the populace. That, that's that's it's unavoidable that, that a, a significant quantity of this uh, in the hands of the population is going to result in a certain number of deaths. That's, you know, that's correct, and we've had these success. These guys have got to know that going in, right? Yes, and we've had success with uh, death investigations post-overdose. Uh, How difficult is it to prosecute the manufacturers of these synthetic drugs? When you were speaking earlier, th here's the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is it's, ro it's reactive. Our, our success with any of the biggest cartels, the most violent, insulated groups, has been with a proactive infiltration to get them indicted, get them convicted, arrest them in the United States, or bring them, extradite them from another, another country. The problem is in a reactive case, the, 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 the harm has already occurred, so now you're trying to uh, rebuild that. It's challenging, especially when the substances aren't necessarily Schedule I substances. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This concludes today's hearing. Thanks to all of our distinguished witnesses for attending. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. The hearing is adjourned.